My name is John Kaufman. Currently, I live here in Kowloon, Hong Kong. I've been living here permanently for the last five years. Started coming to Hong Kong in 1999 for the first World Wing Chun Conference and to begin training with uh, Chu Shan Tin, who was a student of Ip Man. And um, I had trained in other Wing Chun lineages over the years, starting in New York City in 1977. My first Sifu was Li Moi San, who was a student of Moyat. Moyat was a well-known Sifu in America, having moved there from Hong Kong in the 70s. Um, and Moyat was, at the time, the youngest person to ever be um, approved as a Sifu by Ip Man. Moyat was a student of Ip Man. So I trained in uh, Li Moi San school for two years uh, um, in New York City in the late 70s. Then I moved to Boston and I trained in a non-Ip Man lineage for two years. Um, my Sifu there was Henry Moy, uh, and it was the um, a Guo Lo um, lineage of Wing Chun, which is the name of the small village that um, Lung Zhang retired to after he left Fosan and his medical practice there. Um, also referred to as Qin Xin Wing Chun, side body Wing Chun. Um, it's an existing lineage today, and there are many practitioners of it throughout the world, including London uh, and elsewhere. Um, I trained in that system for two years, and um, then I went to law school. Got married, went to law school, did that, opened a law practice, had children, and I didn't do Wing Chun for 15 years. And it was, I think, 1995 or 1996. Um, I was sitting in court one day reading a local paper and there was an ad for a Wing Chun teacher in my small town where I lived in Western Massachusetts in the U.S. at the time. And I said, wow, Wing Chun here, I'm going to do that. So I got back into Wing Chun and my teacher's teacher was a student at the time of Ip Ching, Ip Man's second son. So I began training in the Ip Ching lineage. Um, uh, at the time, and did that regularly for a couple of years. And then um, my teacher decided he didn't want to teach anymore. And he asked me if I wanted to take over the school. And I said yes, because I knew that I was a lazy guy and that if I was just alone, I probably would stop practicing. So teaching would be a good way for me to keep my hand in and, and be active. And, and I love the Wing Chun, so I decided to do that. It was only a couple of months later that they had the opening of the Wing Chun Museum in Dayton, Ohio in the fall of 1998. And I read about it and I'd wanted to go. I didn't know anyone else who was going to be there, but I wanted to go. So um, I flew out there, it was for a weekend, and uh, we were supposed to meet, congregate in a Chinese restaurant initially. So. Um, I knew there'd be people there from all over the world, and it was publicized some of the important Wing Chun masters would be there, like Ip Chun and Ip Ching and Hawkins Chung from California, and Mak Po and Chu Shan Tin. And I'd heard some of these names, but I didn't really know much about them. Um, although I did know Ip Ching, and I'd met him, and, uh, and I'd touched hands with him, and, um, and, and I was learning his methods at the time. Um, so I flew out there and I'm sitting in the Chinese restaurant and uh, this guy walks past the booth and asks me, is anybody sitting there? And I say no and he, he sits down so we start talking like you would. Um, How long have you been doing Wing Chun? Who is your Sifu? And so forth. Well it turns out, and this guy's name is Marty Anderson. Marty Anderson from Duluth, Minnesota. He explains to me that he hasn't done Wing Chun in 18 years, not since 1980. That he's never even left Duluth, Minnesota, his hometown, in 18 years. That the only reason he came to Ohio to attend the opening of the museum was to say hello to his old Sifu, Choi Shan Tin. That he had been Choi Shan Tin's first uh, Western student in Hong Kong in the decade of the 1970s. When he began, it was 1970, it man was still alive. And Chu Shantin told him that he had gone to Ip Man to ask his permission to see if he could teach Marty. 
And obviously the answer was yes, because he agreed to teach Marty. Marty trained with him off and on for the next 10 years. So then, uh, it turns out we're staying in the same hotel. So we go back there after dinner, and he asks me if I want to come up to his room to do some Wing Chun, because he hasn't done it in a long time. I say, sure. And I think I'm pretty good. I mean, I've been training with Ip Man's son for a couple of years, and, and his students, and, and um, I practiced regularly, and I felt pretty good about what I could do at the time. So I go up to his room, and he, um, he asks to see my Sunam Tao form. So I do the entire form the way I'd been taught and the way I'd been practicing. And he asked me, what's this? So I'm thinking to myself, oh, this guy doesn't know anything. Any Wing Chun person knows that this is human Sao. So I, I, I patiently explained to him, well, it's called human Sao. It means circling hand. He goes, oh, okay, what's it for? And I, now I'm thinking to myself, of course I don't say it, ah, I know, I know this guy doesn't know anything because all Wing Chun people know Hugh and Sal. So I explain, well you see, here we can stand up. I say, it's, it's okay? okay, I say, if your hand is coming in, it's to redirect the energy and create a gap to strike through. He says to me, oh okay, do it. <laughs> so then he takes his hand very slowly and starts moving it to me, you do that. And I go to Hyun Sao, and I can't move his hand. So then, okay, thank you. So then he says to me, well, you see, John, if you're already in contact with someone, you might be able to do it that way. But if you're not, you really got to put something into it. I go, oh, okay. So then, like what I learned later, most Tushantin people do, he starts demonstrating some simple little things to show me um, what he does in his Kung Fu and, and some of his ideas about it. And there's simple things like he'd hold my arms and I'd, I'd hold his and he'd tell me to push him and I couldn't move him and he'd just be standing like this and I'd be you know, pushing him as hard as I could and he'd just stand there and I couldn't move him and, and he's standing in a front stance. He's not uh, a, a bow stance. Um, and things like he'd just stand like this and have me stand in front of him with my hand on his side like this and apply as much force as I could to try to tip him over and I couldn't budge him when he could easily tip me over and he could easily push my body away. Um, he had a focus mitt with him. What's well, another thing he did that I remember now. And he would stand in front of me and hold the mitt up on the side like this and I'd be standing in front of him and he'd tell me to hit the pad you know, as hard as I could. And I, I did several times and, and you know, it didn't have an effect. It, I'd hit the pad, I put force into it, but that's it. Then he had me hold the pad and he just put his hand up like this and he went bang and the pad flew right out of my hand and whack like a shot against the wall. Um, then another thing I remember was he stood in front of me um, and had his hand like this and I was the opposite way so we're holding our palms like this and the idea was on the count of three or whatever would pull on each other and he pulled and I, my body left the floor and I went flying across the room I landed on the bed <laughs> you know, over there. It was so impressive to me but then we started doing a little chiso. And as soon as I touched him and we started to move, I couldn't even stand up. My whole body was being yanked around like this and it just hit me at will. And I, I, in, in the years that I had trained in Wing Chun, I had never experienced anything like that before from anybody, not even close. So I was so excited to see that this is a possibility in the Kung Fu world and in Wing Chun in particular. I was so excited. I'd, couldn't care less about the museum anymore. I just want to train with this guy. So like the next morning, six in the morning, I call him up in his room. I go, come on, let's train. <laughs> so he spent that weekend and he shared, he was kind and he was a very humble man. He told me if I thought he could do anything, which I knew he was very skillful, and he would say, no, he said, I'm not very good, he would say about himself. He says, if you think I can do anything, you should see Chu Shantin. Now I know years later, it's been, what, 18 years later, that um, all of Chu Shantin's top people say the same thing. I've never met anybody who trained with him 
in some of them had been in students for more than 40 years. And when I say 40 years, I'm talking about people who went regularly for 40 years. Um, and none of them, not one, will say that their skill even approaches Chu Shantin's. So um, I was very enamored by this way and, and what he had explained to me about the power of relaxation and so forth. So I, I decided I wanted to try to learn this as best as I could. So I spent the next year, I stopped training in the Ip Ching method and I tried to learn some of the ideas that Marty was sharing with me um, over the next year. And then uh, the, one year later in the autumn of 99, I talked him into coming back to Hong Kong with me. It was my first trip here to attend the first World Wing Chun Conference. That's when I started training at Chu Shunton School. So I would go to train in his school every year, sometimes I'd miss a year, for a couple of weeks uh, from the U.S. And uh, I did that for a, a number of years, you know, 10 years. Um, and trying to learn this way of doing Wing Chun as best I could in that vein, uh, in the times that I could actually train there personally and also continue to, to practice what of course was simply my limited understanding of it. <laughs> back home in the U.S. And, and I continue to teach this way as best that I could. So you mentioned before that you were training in Ip Ching lineage yes. previously. Yes. Um, and now your thoughts on Wing Chun is that it's an internal system. So would you say before you were training in this lineage that you're training now, would you say you was training external or was, was it still internal? Okay. I, I, obviously anything I say is simply my opinion. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. Uh, what I believe is that um, most of the Wing Chun I see and I see a lot of it living here in Hong Kong, and many Wing Chun practitioners come through Hong Kong. Some people think of it as the Mecca of Wing Chun. So uh, I meet them uh, and touch hands with many people. Um, most of the Wing Chun that I, ha I see, I consider to be more of an external expression of Kung Fu. Um, and within that approach, it can be very varied. So. And you have a lot of very, very skillful people and, and excellent fighters that use external methods, at least I think of them as external methods, to practice their Wing Chun. Now, many of these practitioners may say or believe that they uh, are practicing internally. I don't necessarily agree, but we all are welcome to our opinions. So relaxation, okay, to, to, to do internal Kung Fu, the first thing that is stressed and taught we want to develop is the ability to release, to let go, to relax. So that's that. I feel it. Okay? Yeah. See, I'm not holding a shape and then I move the shape around and change it from one to another. Yeah. I'm simply relaxing. Yeah. See, Fu Ma calls it settling. I, I'm settled. Now, I can settle on your hand, which is no good, because if I'm in con right, you not you really understand. Go, right. If I settle on you, you run around and hit me. My hand goes to the floor. Okay. So if I'm going to use my weight like that, I want to settle it on you, not on the ground. Okay. That's the limbs weight, the arms weight, the upper arm and the forearm. That's our, <laughs> what our arm is comprised of, right? The upper arm settles to the elbow. You do that by what you already did, relax the shoulder, okay? So you can feel the weight of your upper arm in my hand. Yes. Okay? Now, to relax the forearm, I'm sure you already can guess, <laughs> it's relaxing the elbow joint. And then the forearm can fall, okay? So when you relax this one, the weight of your upper arm falls to here, right? That's right. Then when you relax this, yeah, it's good. Now the weight of your arm, you see, is on me. Okay. Now you can actually feel it at, at, well, as, as you guide me through it. I can yes. feel the weight drop in here. Yes. And then with, with your guidance, I can feel yes. it coming this way as well. So Absolutely. Yeah, you can feel it. That's what you want to be able to do. See. So you can practice by releasing a joint to feel the weight of what's underneath the joint, what's below the joint. So you want to feel the upper arm, which is below the shoulder, you relax the shoulder, and the upper arm can fall. You want to feel the forearm, relax the elbow, and what's, what's below the elbow is the forearm, and that falls. 
Now, if you let everything fall straight down, then I can run around and hit you, just like you did to me. So you don't want to do that. If you're going to use your, the natural weight, you want it to fall on me, my spine, my center, your partner's center. That's why I'm touching myself here, okay? Um, so think of it as forward gravity, okay? Now, the, the rest of you, your torso, your legs, is always falling straight down to the ground. You could call that gravity principle, water principle, chi, sinking chi is the classic description, okay? That's always falling straight down through yourself into the earth, okay? That's never falling forward. But from the shoulder to the hand is falling forward gravity. So if you settle on me, which is to release this and this so the weight's arm falls on me, okay? Good, 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 good. And now you just tell yourself you're about to sit down, but don't lower your body. There, okay? Now you've accessed your natural body weight and it's connected to me. How do you know it's connected? If you move your hands somewhere, okay? slower. Just move them both in, like through the door. Settle again, good. And now move your hands to the door. Yeah, see how it moves my body? Effortlessly. Not, I could resist that. I could brace myself. I could react to it. But you know that your weight is on me because when you start to move, it's moving me. It means we're connected. Right. Yeah, and the, the feeling that I have as well, it, it feels like as soon as I, I, I go through that process and I drop my weight, it feels like I'm really stuck to you. Yes. Or, or should I say, you're stuck to me, I don't know which way around, but... There, there are both important concepts, but the higher level one is you make me feel like I have to stick to you. That's one interpretation of the term chi sao, sticking hand. So imagine, every joint in your body is a gear, okay? And you want to move? The gears stay where they are, they just spin. And because they're connected, when one turns, they all turn. In place. You with me so far? Mm. That's why I stress, stay where you are. In place, you're moving in place. It's also what I, how I understand the concept of motion in stillness, or stillness in motion, which is, of course, a common concept in internal arts. So, if you just imagine that every joint is a gear, stay where you are and start turning all the joints. Yeah, see that, see how you move my body? Okay, so one joint drives the next joint, like the gear, like yeah. you said. Yeah. Yes, and you don't have to identify the joints, you don't have to isolate them, you don't have to do any of that. So the question is, how do I start turning the gears? That's just tell yourself to do it. Well, how do I do it? I don't know. I don't care. Pretend you already know how. That's 90% of this stuff, and I mean that. Because that's how you, idea. How do you know which one you need to move first? You, you move them all. You move them all at the same time? Yes, because they're connected. You can't move, if they're connected, you can't move one without them all moving. But is there one on the, on the chain that starts first? No. 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 That's why it's internal. It's the inside movement that moves the outside. Um, when you feel how to do that and you get comfortable with it, you don't need the visualization anymore. You don't have to think about gears. It's just how you move, all right? Now, you, you mentioned, do you have to know which gear starts the motion, moves first, etc.? I said no. They all, if they're connected, they all move at the same time. Let me add to that the, the idea that the more you get moving, the, more, the better your Kung Fu, all right? So if I only move, stop me, if I only, this is muscle pushing. Yes, that can be more effective if I brace myself on the ground, press my left heel into, or foot flat into the ground to drive up through the joints and out is more effective than if I don't do that, I just push with my hand, okay? So there are varying methods, of course, of moving externally to develop greater force. But if I'm using internal method and I'm just relax and um, start to turn the gears, okay, see? I'm not pressing here. You don't feel any extra pressure in your hand when I start turning the gears. You see? See how it moves your body? But those were just this and this and this. Those were the only gears I used. What if every joint in my body, including the vertebrae, 
is a gear. And then you start moving all of them. See how the power comes through? Mm -hmm. And the more you move inside, the more effect it has with less external motion. That's why they say, and this is a common phrase, uh, in internal martial arts, the more you learn how to move, the greater the movement inside, the less outside, vice versa, okay? And alignment that's talked about so often in, in martial arts, including Wing Chun, I view anyway as, as another method of moving. So that if you align your joints, so you've got that line that you, you created and I can feel it right now, okay? Now how do you use that line? Go ahead, there. You know how to do that. I'm sure you were taught and I'm sure you've learned it in different systems and you practiced it. So you create an alignment and then how do you use it? You tell me, how do you use that? You just did. Um, yeah, in that way, so we can do it from a contact point. So if, if someone's giving you pressure, you right. take it down. So you yeah. align the joints and let it go down to the floor, yes. from the floor back out. Okay, okay. Um, so you kind of create a connection through yourself. And by being in contact with me, it's then connected to me. So then you um, use that alignment from the ground to do what? To, to press the ground so it comes up through your joints and out and yes. through me. Yeah, so we could do it two ways. So we, we, could, um, we could do it by pressing first and then giving it back. Okay. Or as you start to give pressure, I let it go down and then give it back. So it's like a spring. Yes, yes. So. Either way, you're still letting force go down and come back up and out like a spring. Am I right? Yes. I okay, exactly. okay. Um, that is a different concept and method than the gears, okay? So now, don't think about alignment. I'm not saying you don't have one. I'm saying don't think about it. You'll, you'll always have an alignment um, if you are relaxed without collapsing, okay? So you just stand. You have an alignment right now, okay? Whether you're aware of it or not, it's not important. Now start turning all the gears. There, right? Now, that's, different. that's a different way of producing force than through using the motion from the ground up and out of your aligned joints. Of course alignment's important because if you're using the ground through you out, of course if you're not aligned properly, then the pressure down rebounding back up through doesn't get through you and out. It doesn't have an effect or as much of one if you have broken alignment. Okay. Chu Shantin always talked about his teachings were very simple, but they were entirely consistent. And he always, let me put it this way, very quickly, he's described a number of times orally and in writing when he began training with it, man, what he was told to do. So what he said was, when he started at 19 years old, it man told him, young man, do this and you'll get good. And by this, he meant stand up straight and do sin and pow and use no force. Those were his only instructions. That's it. So 19-year-old Chu Shantin said to himself, well, I guess I'll do what my teacher tells me to do. He made a conscious decision to follow those instructions. Where other students were doing fancier other things, he spent two years, hours every day, standing, trying to keep straight, and do the Sun and Tao movements of the form, most importantly using no force. He said that he did that for a while, I don't know how long, overall it was two years, but at some point during that two years, he said he started to feel things. I don't know, I can't say, but I interpret that as meaning one way of saying it, he felt his chi moving. And he said it felt good. So he had a motive, an incentive to keep doing it. And he did. And then he came to a point where he wanted to test it out. So he started chi sang with other students and he'd get beat up. He couldn't use it. But he kept doing it that way. Go through the form, use no force. In other words, don't try to put power into it. Don't try to be strong. Just relax and go through the motions. So as he got to the point then where no one could touch him. And he was known to have the best defense in the Ip Man school. My friend Marty, who was really good, I'm telling you that, I've touched hands with him, and he's highly skilled. He's got a lot of power, and he, he's very good. 
He said he spent 10 years qi saoing with Chu Shantin because that was Chu Shantin's main way of teaching back then was to qi sao with all the students every night, for six hours a night. He says, Marty qi sao with him for 10 years. He says he only touched the guy once. And that's when the, ed the tips of his fingers grazed his nose like that. And Chu Shantin, I was surprised. <laughs> he never could hit him. Wow. And Chu Shantin never hit back. He just defended. He always recommended, you want to learn how to attack, just defend. The attacking part is easy if you can defend. Anyway, that's what he said. So he stressed the use no force, okay? Um, and these were simple instructions, but one's understanding and more importantly, ability to actually use no force in their own movements is a never ending struggle to understand and to develop. We all can understand the words, the concepts, but to really be able to do it is always a never-ending process. So I, I, the idea of I'm already perfect. So I'm not doing something, I'm not using part of myself to fix my position in space or to make a strong structure so when you push me, I can hold you away, right? Use my line, use my legs, use my elbow power, use even my expansion, okay? I'm just let go. I'm not trying to use anything. This is why this is difficult to train. Because the way we all learn how to learn is, what am I supposed to do? You're my teacher. Please tell me and I'll practice it because I'm a good student and I'll get it right. Then I'll get good, right? No. This is about not doing. It's not about what to do. It's how to be. Yeah, forgive the flowery language. It's about being, not doing. So it is very much a Taoist, it's very much uh, meditative. Now, I, I'm not saying, oh, you should sit in a room with the lights out and meditate, or I don't care what people do, and I'm a lazy man, I don't do anything. And I'm not bragging about it, I'm just admitting it. So I'm just, not, I'm just turning everything off. Now, everything means everything, though. If I turn this off, see? But not my legs, I'm squeezing my knees right now. And you push me. You'll move me through my knees. Sure, I can brace, so it's harder for you to move me. You didn't give me much force, and I let you move me away. But if you feel what I'm using, what am I using right now to brace? You're using your back leg. That's right. So push my back leg. Can you sure, you could do all those yeah. kinds of things. Push my back leg. Yep, yeah, I'm gone. If I'm bracing with my back leg, which is a good thing to do, right? My weight's on my back leg, and you push this. I can still brace, but if you relax through it and settle on my back leg and push that, I'm gone right away, okay? Then you can feel that. You use what you want to stop me. Okay, so I'm just gonna try to push this. You have no problem staying there. I'm just wearing out my tricep by pushing on you, okay? Instead, if I relax to what you're using and just push that, you're gone right away, right? So all these methods of bracing and everything have its purpose, but at the end of the day, they don't work very well if your partner or opponent knows how to affect that part of you, whatever it is you're using, right? Okay, so when I talk about I'm not using anything, I'm not doing anything, I mean I'm not using a part of myself instead of other parts. So I'm not trying to think of what do I use or how do I use it. I'm just happy where I am, okay? Now, and when you push me, I'm just, yeah, okay, yeah. okay? So it, it begins by being able to do that. So I'm already perfect, I'm just here. So why does it work? It, it, my, uh, my feeling is this, when you just are already perfect everywhere, and I push you, yeah, that's quite good. Look, I push you hard enough to throw myself away, you don't even feel it. You're not in jeopardy of going back and landing on the couch or falling over. The camera will prove you just stood in the same position. And you're not fighting me with the, you're not getting tired in your arm, right? No. So what's happening? I'm giving you force. Here, use this. Yeah, use it. Tense it. Good. Now, that's the force I'm giving you. Equal, the yeah. same other example, okay? So I am giving you force and I'm pressing with my foot, okay? But you don't feel it. Why? 
Right now, see, you don't feel it. And I don't feel it in my legs. No, either. nowhere, so nowhere, like nowhere. Why? Because what's really happening is everything is being used equally. No, you're not using part, whether, no matter what that part is. Your scapula, your lower back, your foot, your leg, your hip, your arm, shoulder, to the exclusion of other parts. No. Everything's used equally. Meaning it's just there. So my force, because you're relaxing, this is the meaning of relaxing. Not falling down, not collapsing, okay? Not, well, I think I'm relaxed, but I'm really pu pushing you. No, I just... Okay? So if you allow the, the fascia and the ligaments that, to support force equally, not let it go down through the bone, push me, not let it go down through the bone to the ground and then back out. But it's, when you push, it's supported by the fascia, you understand? Mm -hmm. Then I don't have to fight this, neither do I have to let it go down and bring it back up. It's always just there. So it's there. And in that condition, I just move. Okay? So, Chu Shantin, no force, right? He also, the things he stressed, I told you his teaching is very simple, but profound. Use no force, stand up straight. Stand up straight in the later years became raise energy up from the base of the spine through the spine to the crown of the head, which you hear all the time in terms of uh, Kundalini Yoga and many other practices of raising energy up through the spine, which is consistent with traditional Chinese medical theory of qi moving through the meridians, right? You're not forcing the qi to. You're op to cure disease, you're opening blockages in the meridians for the qi to flow freely. That's right. So if that's what you're doing in your spine, if you're thinking when he talks about raising energy up through the spine, it's not a physical activity. And he said himself, you learn how to do this, it becomes an idea. It's another function of idea. It's the idea of it. You don't try to feel it physically, okay? So, when you relax like we talked about, see, that's quite good. Everything is open. You didn't open it. That's what I mean when I say there's no how-to. You didn't do that. It is a way of being which came about naturally as a result of you stop trying to fix yourself. Mm -hmm. You with me? I understand. Okay. So you're just there. And so is every part of your body. Every cell is in the same condition. Way of being. This is a way of being, not a way of doing. Does this make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, in that condition, now we're getting to the end of it, at least my end of it. I'm sure there's a hell of a lot more that I had no idea about, right? Is, but you've got to move. So the key is to maintain this condition when you move, even though I'm going to be fighting and resisting you, okay? So you see how that feels like nothing. If you start to use something, I don't care what it is, any method, yes, to move, see I'm resisting, you don't, you're not in the same condition anymore, are you? Now you want to, this is the hard part. You want to stay, you want to have that same feeling when you move your hand. So here's a little trick. And let's just see if it works. So don't make a fist. Okay. Nothing. Very good. Nothing, nothing. Now this is different from what I said about settling on me. You're not settling on me. You're not trying to be heavy. You're just yourself, right? Okay. Now you see how it feels like very relaxed, nothing? Okay. If you start consciously or otherwise think, figuring out what to use to move this, you are already lost it. Okay? That's what I mean when there's no how-to. Okay? So don't think about using anything. This is not easy to do because we're so used to, well, what do I use? How do I use it? Just move your hand. There. That's powerful. And you go, oh, that's bullshit. Uh, you didn't feel anything. How could I move away? You didn't feel anything. You never feel your own power when you're doing this right. When you end up doing it this way, no force. This is what it means, no force, right? Everything is moving like we talked about. You're just not aware of it because you're not trying to use it, right? Every, you're using everything. Yeah. Okay? So if you chi sao, if you use that in your, in your movement when you're being opposed, whether it's chi sao sparring or anything else, 
It's just a function of, um, you know, I'm not going to fight you like this, okay? I'm certainly going to get my hands in a ready position. No, not like this, but, but just up so I have less distance to travel. It's not like a lot of martial arts, Wing Chun included, from what I see anyway, is they're taught, oh, center is all important and our, our defense is our offense, right? So everything is, you're attacking me, and I just want to try to punch you, punch you, punch you, punch you, punch you, punch you. Uh, my first move is to punch you, make contact. This is a little different. I'm not trying to hit you. My first move is just, however the contact is made, if I can have that kind of, okay? Then that's, that's when I can hit you, okay? Because you can't respond until you regain your equilibrium. And it all happens split second. So it's all simple. So it's just going to look like that. That's it. But to train it up, we must start from stillness and maintain stillness when we move. So you ask yourself, what do the muscles feel like everywhere, but in particular here, all that. What does that feel like? Do this motion back and forth. Like, yeah. Relaxed. Right. Now you want them to stay feeling like that when I resist. See? It's hard. It, you th it's very difficult because it's not natural. What's natural is to start using something mm -hmm. because unconsciously we want to protect ourselves, which means use something to stop my, my hand, my resisting force, right? So you just, it should feel like that all the time, nothing, whether I'm touching you, resisting you or not. So how to do that? You have to practice. You have to use your mind to let all that stay turned off when you move. And it's against our instinct because we want to have power. It feels like there'll be no power. We don't trust it. But with practice, you can learn to trust it.